supporting us and our work. Um, you know, we derive strength and encouragement from our partners and well-wishers, and we're very grateful that you could be here today. Um, for those of you who might not be as familiar, let me just briefly restate with his mission. We are an independent think tank. We do legal and policy research to make better laws and improve governance for the public good. Uh, the annual briefing book that Vidhi uh, launches every year is core to this mission of writing better laws and improving governance. Every year we suggest 25 reforms uh, to law and governance that we think government should consider. We present these in short 700 word nuggets um, and we hope that they catch the attention of lawmakers and policymakers, and that we can then work with them to translate these into legal and policy change. Some of our briefing books in the past have focused on particular themes. We've dealt with cooperative federalism. We've looked at law through the lens of data. Um, we've, of course, you know, in the post, during the pandemic, we've also looked at how law and governance should be adapted to deal with crises like the pandemic. For the 75th year of um, India's independence, we thought it was only fitting to look at the colonial origins of our laws and legal systems. We thought this would also be appropriate because one of the first projects that Vidhi uh, undertook was with the Law Commission of India under the chairpersonship of Justice A.P. Shah, where we looked at obsolete laws and how they might be uh, repealed. And ironically, one of the entries in our briefing book today suggests how the Law Commission itself needs to be revamped. So things really have come full circle. I'm not here to you know, talk about decolonization and what that means. We have the real star, Dr. Bibek Debroy, who will be delivering the lecture after this. And I'm sure everyone is looking forward to hearing that. Uh, I'll just speak briefly about what we as lawyers were thinking about when we went about, uh, you know, writing the entries in this briefing book and what, what a colonial law or idea means to us. So there were a, a few different ways in which we approached it. One was, of course, you know, what, what makes, which laws are colonial by design or by intent, which laws are intended to perpetuate a certain kind of colonial rule um, and, and to remind their subjects of that colonial rule. And this ranges from, you know, the architecture in our high courts, which is imposing in its grandeur, but also intimidating as well as provisions in the uh, penal statutes, like the prohibition on assembling peacefully, um, the prohibition on sedition, etc., which continue to be uh, used in a variety of forms today by the state. So this, is, this was one category of laws where we looked at how uh, colonial laws suppressed certain kinds of freedoms and examine whether they have place today in a modern constitutional republic. The other was simply looking at laws that had become outdated by virtue of the fast paced changes in technology uh, that we see around us today. So it seems arcane to have a registration act that doesn't allow for the online registration of documents or to have usurious lending laws that don't tackle, you know, uh, extortionate consumer credit by digital payment apps. So this is, this is an area where, that we examine in our briefing book where we hope to encourage lawmakers to think about upgrading the law. Then the third category that we looked at was laws that were reflective of the kind of attitude of the time to uh, vulnerable subjects or populations. For example, the criminalization of beggary, which seems uh, abhorrent today, uh, but you know, acts like this still continue to, be, to exist on the statute books as well as laws that discriminate against persons affected by leprosy. So we were shocked to find that there were laws that continue to prevent such persons from standing for elected office or from accessing public transport or entering a public library. And this category of suggestions that or reforms that we make in our briefing book deal with how to make the law inclusive. And finally, we look at ensuring accountability. So what are the kinds of institutions that owe their origins to uh, colonial times that reflect a certain kind of understanding of architecture, whether this is the office of the governor, the intelligence bureau, even something like the 
which you know we might not imagine like the drug regulatory authority the way in which it's actually structured reflects the federal division of powers under the government of india act and there is a very concrete impact a very terrible impact that this has today on drug regulation um, you know and as as most of you may be aware of the kind of tragedy that we've witnessed with substandard cough medication some of this can be traced back to the confusing division of powers between central and state drug regulatory authorities so with this set of different kinds of categories we hope to attack or well hope to address and make everyone question colonial laws from uh, different kinds of lenses and we suggest ways in which they might either be uh, amended sometimes just repealed or modified and the idea here is that decolonization should not simply mean as my colleague writes in the introduction to the book the, it should not simply mean the removal of of these vestiges but and, and and a reversion to older practices that existed because you know we know that they they were not perfect but it perhaps provides us with an opportunity to rethink what it means to have uh, an indigenous system that is also in consonance with the values in our uh, modern day republic and this is what we think will help us make that transition from rule by law to the rule of the law which is the title of our briefing book as well so with that short introduction i'd like to invite orko sen gupta dr vivek debroy and my colleague tarika who helped with the coordination of this and putting together of this book up on stage to release the book and maybe kesha if i could ask you to play the short video to uh, release the briefing book officially good evening everyone thank you very much dhwani for that introduction uh, i'll waste no further time the sixth vidhi annual lecture will be delivered by dr bibek debroy there is no one better to deliver a lecture on decolonizing india's law and legal system than dr debroy he is a man of many avatars rolled into one by training an economist he is the chairman of the prime minister's economic advisory council i knew him first as a legal reformer he had directed this large research project called large uh, legal adjustments to regulation uh, in a globalizing economy i hope i've got that one right uh, that's where I, i it was really the first judicial reforms project uh, that uh, that that i had ever encountered he's also a uh, a prolific translator i think that's his, that's the avatar of his that i like the most having translated uh, amongst many other works the ramayana and the mahabharat into english uh, and he's also a, a provocative and engaging author he's written multiple books whose latest one inked in india which i've just purchased i think i've just left it there uh, tells the very interesting story of uh, fountain pen ink and nib manufacturers in india and through that the story of india itself uh, and i'm really delighted uh, that dr dibek dibek debroy is going to deliver 
the Vidhi annual lecture on the subject of decolonizing our laws. Decolonization is something, is a word that we've heard a lot over the course of the last couple of years. I think it's imperative for us to understand what decolonization means. I heard recently the Chief Justice of India also saying that decolonization must mean access to justice. Decolonization at a very basic level, we all at Bidhi believe should mean that people write laws simply. We, it's an irony that we continue to write laws in, in an arcane Victorian style of English, whereas the, the English themselves write in plain language. So I think it's, a, it's ironic that we continue these these practices that we've inherited without questioning them. But decolonizing our laws is not just about changing the legal system, it is also about decolonizing our minds. Uh, and I'm really excited by what Dr. Bibek Debroy has to say, as I'm sure are all of you. He's also very kindly consented to take questions after his lecture, so I request that everyone stays back. Without any further ado, I invite with his sixth annual lecturer, Dr. Bibek Debroy. Thank you, Vidhi, and particularly Dr. Argha Sengupta for having shown me this kindness of inviting me to deliver this particular lecture. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me assure you that in a formal sense, I'm not exactly qualified to deliver this lecture. I'm not a lawyer. Argha mentioned the law reforms project that I headed a long, long time ago, 30 years ago. And at that time, all my economist friends thought I was a lawyer, and all my lawyer friends thought I was an economist. Now, of course, many people think I'm a journalist. Be that as it may, I'm going to talk not only about decolonizing India's statutes, but also decolonizing India's legal system. And also, as Orgo said, decolonizing the mindset. I will start with an anecdote. And that anecdote is an anecdote I encountered when I embarked on this law reforms project 30 years ago. And this anecdote concerns Lord Linlithgow. Lord Linlithgow, who was the Governor General and Viceroy from 1936 to 1943. Incidentally, Lord Linlithgow was also the Chairman of the Parliamentary Joint Select Committee that led to the Government of India Act of 1935. And the Government of India Act of 1935 is something that I will come back to later. For the moment, the anecdote about Lord Linlithgow. Lord Linlithgow became the Governor General and the Viceroy in the year 1935. Prior to that, there was a Royal Commission on Agriculture formed in 1926, and in 1928, it submitted a report. Like all government commissions, nothing happened to the report or to the recommendations. It went into a dust. In 1973, Tamil Nadu set up 
and administrative reforms commission like other states also have and amongst other things the task of this administrative reforms commission was to identify surplus government jobs and recommend their abolition its task was to identify surplus government jobs and recommend their abolition while they were doing this in 1973 they discovered that there were jobs known as lbas and lbks and no one had the foggiest idea what lbas were and lbks were and what they did because all the existing LBAs and the LBKs had retired and were drawing pensions. So they were summoned to explain what they did. And the entire story came out. What was the story? I told you Lord Lindigo was the chairman of a Royal Commission on Agriculture. I also told you that no one paid the slightest bit of heed to its recommendations. It was a commission on agriculture and animal husbandry, of course. And one of its recommendations was Indian cows are weak. So we need to import foreign bulls and use them to impregnate Indian cows so that the quality of the species improves. Nothing was done about those recommendations until it was suddenly announced that Lord Linlithgow had become the Governor General and the Viceroy. So one alert official in what was then the Madras presidency, woke up. He thought, oh my God, Lord Linlithgow has become the Governor General and Viceroy, and the moment he turns up in India, he's going to ask, what has happened to my recommendation? In the government system, the creation of jobs is also as difficult as the abolition of So this clever gentleman thought that the best way to implement the recommendations and to create the government jobs was to invoke the governor general's name in the job description itself. So LBAs were Lin Lithgow's bull assistants and LBKs were Lin Lithgow's bull keepers. <laughs> The keepers imported the foreign bulls and there was a government subsidy involved. But because there was a government subsidy involved, you needed to ensure that the public expenditure was being done in the right way, transparent way. So the LBAs were the assistants who inspected and ensured that the impregnation was done at the right time. There's an anecdote about Britain. I don't know whether this is true or not. In 1812, according to the anecdote, a man was employed to stand on the cliffs of Dover with a telescope and ring a bell if he saw Napoleon coming. That job, I'm told, was abolished after the Second World War. In that colonial tradition, the LBAs and the LBKs were finally abolished in the 1980s. The gentleman who told me this anecdote was a member of the Tamil Nadu Administrative Reforms Commission. And when I heard this anecdote, I started to laugh like you are. He said, stop. Don't laugh. We weren't able to do anything about CCA. So I asked, what on earth are CCAs? Winston Churchill, as you know, was very fond of cigars. 
and World War II disrupted his supply of cigars from Havana. Until someone clever again from Madras presidency discovered that cheroots from Trichy were a convenient substitute. So Churchill's cigar assistant was created to source these cheroots and deliver them to England. After World War II, when Winston Churchill was no longer the prime minister, the British decided to continue with the system. So the person who told me this said we were not able to abolish TCA. I don't know whether the force still exists. But whenever I go to Chennai, all over the place I see advertisements for Churchill cigar. So for all I know, those posts still exist. Rule of law. What is rule of law? We need to define what is law, and law means all kinds of different things. At one level, law is the statutory law. The statutory law in our system can either be at the union government level, or it can be at the state government. And of course, there is administrative law, which is not quite statutory law. One of the issues which was mentioned in the initial remarks, and I think is there in Vidhi's book also, is that of old law, dysfunctional pieces of legislation. Dysfunctional pieces of legislation exist in other countries also. The taxi cabs in England and therefore also in Australia are governed by Hackney Carriages Acts. And Hackney Carriages Acts Hackney carriages were drawn by the government. So hackney carriages were required and still are to have adequate hay for horses. And even today, the law for taxi cabs in London or in England or even in Canada or parts of Canada says that you cannot have a taxi unless it is stocked with enough hay and feed for the horses. In Tennessee, in Memphis, even today, it is illegal for a woman to drive a car unless there is a man who is running in front waving a red flag warning passes by that it's a lady who's driving a car. So old laws exist in many common law jurisdictions. Because in common law jurisdictions, unlike civil law jurisdictions, we don't have a system of desuetudes, which simply means that a law is a statute is not open-ended it comes to an end after a stipulated period of time. I'll come back to this later. We are in Delhi. I'm certain very few people, I don't know about Orgo, I suspect even Orgo doesn't know this. I'm certain you do not know that there is an East Punjab Agricultural Pest Diseases and Noxious Weeds Act of 1949, which applies to Delhi even today. What does this say? It says that if Delhi is invaded by locusts, the district magistrate shall announce this through the beating of drums. 
and every able bodied person must be out on the streets to help fight against that invasion of locusts there was the swaraj act of 1867 which has now been repealed the east punjab act has not been repealed it's still there what does the swaraj act say the swaraj act says swaraj are those roadside places to provide drinking water it says all sarais must give passers by free drinks of water it's now been repealed but there was a case against a five star hotel near gateway of india you can guess which one which hotel brought against the hotel because it was not allowing passers by to come and use the toilets in the hotel the point i am making is old laws exist in other countries but in other countries old laws are generally not used for purposes of harassment in a country like india old laws are used aircraft act of 1934 exists even today 1934 remember the vintage 1934 what was happening in 1934 amongst other things a lot of violence associated with freedom movements so if you go look up the aircraft act of 1934 it will find you will find it defines aircraft and the definition of aircraft not only includes airplanes it also includes kites i don't mean the birds i mean the other kinds of kites there are kite festivals in some parts of the country and the aircraft act says you cannot fly a kite without the permission of the government so whenever there is a kite festival the cops will descend on poor vendors who are selling kites and say where is your license and use that as an avenue for bribery and rents i mentioned this statute earlier <coughs> in a common law jurisdiction <coughs> the courts have ruled i'm not going to bore you with the exact reference that boring bit will be done by vidhi later courts have ruled that an old law can become dysfunctional only if one you can prove the statute has not been in operation there will be no cases under it for a long period of time which is which is reasonably easy to prove the second clause is you must demonstrate that the contrary practice is followed which is almost impossible to establish so until we have a system where every statute has a sunset clause built into it the statute will not automatically expire many many years ago when i was involved with the law reforms project i wrote a book 2000 in the year 2000 and i counted how many statutes we have that go back to the 19th century there were 139 139 today if i want to know the statutes in india the union government statutes i have india code in those days india code did not exist a more complete list is something like 200 so 200 from the 19th century 
one of the questions that has always bothered me is in 1950 we had the new constitution in 1950 why did we not all examine all of these old statutes and decide whether to accept them or to junk them it wasn't done there was a perfunctory exercise in 1960-61, very, very perfunctory. There was a more serious attempt in 2001 and 2002. And most of you know that since 2015 and 2016, almost 1,500 old statutes have been jumped. They've gone. An exercise that should have happened many, many years ago. What's the oldest statute in India now? It is the Bengal Districts Act of 1837. By the way, if you ever go to Bangladesh, you will discover it exists there also. And what is this single sentence in this statute supposed to say? What does it say? It says, the West Bengal government today can use this statute to create as many districts as it wants. I mean, come on. States are creating districts all over the place without a statute. Why do we need the statute any longer? Of course, this is a harmless piece of statutes. But the point I'm making is about 1,700 old statutes were identified for repeat. They have no purpose. About 1,700. More than 1,700. 1,500, almost 1,500 of them have been repealed by the union government. We now have the constitution. And the court's instruction is, as you know, in the constitution, we have a seventh schedule and we have a union list, we have a state list, and we have a congress. The court's instruction is, even if it is pre-1950, if it concerns an item that is in the state list, only the state has the right to repeal it, not the union government. So we are still waiting for about 250 old statutes at the state government level to be repealed. They haven't been. At the union government level, when they were repealed, it was as a result of a systematic exercise. Except for the state of Kerala, and Rajasthan, to which I will come in a minute, no such exercise has been undertaken in any state in the country. In the initial remarks, you heard about the Union Law Commission. Valid point. It's long past its glory days. But there's also a question mark about state-level law commissions, whether they exist, whether they don't exist, and what do they do? Everyone here knows about the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Court, IBC. IBC is also meant to address exit problems for MSMEs. That part has not yet been implemented yet. And remember that between 95 to 97% of MSME is not registered under any law. Forget the Companies Act. It's not even registered under the Single Proprietorship Act. And competition, which is what the reforms imply, means not only entry, it also means exit. So there must be satisfactory exit provisions for MSME. Pre-IBC and to some extent even post-IBC, no such exit provisions exist. exist. So if I'm sick, I default on Provident Fund. If I'm sick, I default on utilities, payments. 
What some of you may not be aware is that any such default is treated under the law as default of land revenue. And what do the land revenue laws of the 1870s say? That if you default on land revenue, the district magistrate can issue an order, you are picked up and dumped in jail. So effectively, punishing the entrepreneur, not the enterprise. There are also issues criminal provisions. Recently, some of you may know in the newspapers that ORF team has done a study on unnecessary imprisonment provisions. A crime is a crime, but does it necessarily have to deal with imprisonment? A rich person should never be imprisoned. Person guilty of a crime should never be imprisoned. Because it is at the cost of the public health. It is only a poor person who cannot afford to pay who must be imprisoned. This is a value judgment. Agree with? It's a value judgment you may disagree with. But you have to accept it has an impe impeccable economic rationale. Who said this? Not the World Bank. Not the law and economics guys from the University of Chicago. Argha mentioned the translations. This was said by Bhishma to Yudhishthira. Lying down on the bed of arrows when he was instructing Yudhishthira and his brothers in Shanti Parva of the Mahavar. These are the 19 most important kinds of civil cases you must try in order of priority. And right at the top, it said breach of contract. I'm not quoting a law commission report. I'm quoting Bhishma again. And I'm quoting the much maligned, rarely read Manu Sanghita again. I said I would talk about Rajasthan. In Rajasthan, in 2015, the then chief minister decided to look at all the laws. When I say all the laws, do understand. Repealing a law is easy. At the stroke of a pen, you can repeal it. It's the easiest task. But rare is it the case when you will be able to repeal a statute in all of its entirety. You will have sections which no longer deserve to exist. That is a much more painstaking exercise. I mentioned the union government repeal. That's the easier one. The more complicated one is sitting down with all the statutes that remain and identify the sections that are old and need to be repealed. In Rajasthan in 2015, the chief minister decided to do this. Much against the advice of the bureaucracy, she did not want to Set up a law commission. She said the law commission will take ages and will do nothing. So she set up a two-person task force. I was the chairman. And the other member was Rakesh Verma, the additional chief secretary. So the first task was to find out how many statutes there were in Rajasthan. There were 950, which gives you a rough idea of the number of statutes that will exist in any state. India code gives us an idea of how many union level statutes there are. How many are there at the state level? You won't be able to know. I mean a complete list, not an indicative list. 
So if Rajasthan had 950, probably most other states also have about 1,000. So he now has a list of 950 statutes. But now he wanted the text. And for about 50 of these, the text was not available anywhere. Not in the assembly, not with the governor, nowhere. So Rakesh and I, we scratched our heads and we said, now what do we do? Until Rakesh had a brain. He said, let's go to the printing press in Jaipur. They must have printed these statutes, so the printing press must have copies. That's how we got all these statutes. And we pruned them from 950 to 200. So this is the broader exercise, not just repealing old ones, but also standardizing, harmonizing, unifying, repealing old sections. And the bulk of laws in Rajasthan, as is the case with every other state, is pertains to land revenue. But do realize, identifying colonial influences also involves taking a position on what we want the role of the state to be. That's an ideological position. For example, in Rajasthan, because of resistance, we could not repeal something called the Boating Regulation Act, which enables the state government to license and control all boating, a bit like the Aircrafts Act. So if we accept that ideological position, that the state need not exercise its malign influence everywhere, we will be able to reduce the number of statutes from 200 to 100. I mentioned the seventh schedule. Most economists will talk about factor markets. What are factor markets? Well, land, labor, capital. Land is entirely in the state list. Labor is in the concurrent list. Oh, yes, we read about some states which have matched revenue records with satellite imagery. Using technology have done wonderful things. Of course they have. But what about a state like Jharkhand, where the last cadastral survey was held in 1932? What about a state like Bihar, where the last cadastral survey was 1911? So all the computerization of land records in some states is just garbage in, garbage out. Before the Industrial Revolution, in England and other parts of Europe, the enclosure movement had freed up land markets. Today, despite Hernando de Soto and several others who not, don't necessarily like Hernando de Soto, we have done nothing about, nothing significant about land. Labor. Oh, economists will talk about the wonderful things that Bangladesh has done in exports of textiles and garments, particularly garments. Most people don't know that in Bangladesh, in 2006, the unified all the employment laws. You will have read that out of the 50 plus union government level statutes, the union government has unified them under four codes of safety, industrial relations, wages, and social security. Absolutely true. But it's only done it for statutes that are administered by the Ministry of Labor. What about the Shops and Establishments Act, administered by state? If you look at the Shops and Establishments Act, 
And if you look at the orders that state governments are passing under these four courts, whatever was the intent of the courts is being nullified because the state intervention exists. We live in Delhi. Do we really need the Shops and Establishments Act to tell us that shops on this side of the Najafkar drain will be open and will be closed on this day and on that side will be closed on some other day? Why did Gurgaon become an IT center? Because of the restrictions imposed in Delhi by the Shops and Establishments Act. So I repeat what I said. Repealing an entire statute is easy. In a more holistic sense, we need to examine item by item, section by section, standardize and harmonize. Because if, sec if statutes have been enacted at different points in time, the case law also varies causing further confusion. IPC, must talk about IPC. Indian Penal Code. I don't know how many of you who are non-lawyers are aware of section 125. What is section 125? It is about someone being guilty of a crime if he wages war against an Asiatic power. What on earth is an Asiatic power? Section 310 and 311. They talk about thugs. What about thuggies in the 19th century? There was a Thuggy Act of 1836. So sections 310 and 311, particularly section 311 of IPC, still borrows on the Thuggy Act of 1836. Section 377, everyone knows about section 377. What you perhaps don't know was that section 377 in IPC in 1860, was liberalization. Because before that, the law for such crimes was capital punishment. So just as capital punishment was replaced by imprisonment in Britain, Section 377 was introduced in IPC. You may think this is about morality. Perhaps Victorian morality, nothing of the kind. The antecedents of this go back to King Henry VIII and the Buggery Act of 1833. You know about the conflict between Henry VIII and the monasteries and churches. The churches and monasteries and the nunneries, they possessed a lot of land. And King Henry VIII coveted these things. That is the reason the Buggery Act was introduced so that he could appropriate the land. An economic reason, not a moral reason. And of course, we are bearing the legacy. Indian Police Act. I'm deliberately picking on act that most people are familiar with. 1861, section 15. Section 15 says that any part like Delhi can be declared a disturbed area or a dangerous area. And therefore, we must have more policemen there. So what does Section 15 say? We as citizens must pay for these increased policemen there. I'm sure most of you are not even aware that this exists in the Indian police. Prisons Act, police reforms, the Prakash Singh judgment, nothing has happened. Nothing has happened since 1901, 1902, when there was a police reforms commission. Indian Evidence Act of 1872, it still has references 
to the London Gazette, the Parliament of the Indi United Kingdom, the Sovereign, Her Majesty, Privy Council, Native State, Prince or Ruler in the list of illustrations. And we are going on and on with this. For that matter, think about our becoming a member of the Commonwealth. I'm not getting into the broader question of whether we should be a member of the Commonwealth or not, but we became a member of the Commonwealth under the 1949 London Declaration. Under that, I quote, the king is the symbol of free association. He is the head of the Commonwealth. So as a member of the Commonwealth, we respected this. I mentioned the police. The president has recently talked about under trial. Let me talk about the CRPC because this is an interesting anecdote because otherwise I think it's getting a little bit too heavy, although I'm not going to speak for very much longer. Section 109 and 110. 100, 109 and 110 of CRPC. All of us as educated people think, cops cannot arrest me without a warrant. By and large true. But under section 109 and, 109 and 110 of CRPC, they can if you're a habitual offender, if you're a vagrant. This goes back to the time of the poor laws in England. Many, many years ago, Surjit Singh Banala does many things. He wrote a book in 1996 called Story of an Escape. What is this anecdote? Surjit Singh Banala was the chief minister in Punjab at the height of militancy, mid 80s, although the book came out much later. He got tired of this situation. So one day, without informing anyone, without informing security, without informing his family, he vanished. He disappeared for 10 days. Where did he go? He went to Allahabad. Why Allahabad? Because he studied law at the University of Allahabad. So here, remember, mid-80s, Sikh gentleman, flowing white beard, turban, wandering around you. The cops caught hold of him, said, you're a vagrant. Put him in the jail. Under the law, something like this happens. You have to produce two witnesses who will vouch for your integrity. So they said, who are these two? He had no papers on him. He said, number one, Mulayam Singh Yadav, who was then the chief minister of UP. The cops started to beat him up. Whereupon being a trained lawyer, he said habeas corpus, this, that, and the other, and the matter was sorted. Vidhi is dangerously close to being hauled up under the contempt of courts act. <laughs> We understand the notion of contempt. I'm violating something that court has said. That's contempt. That's civil contempt. But there's also criminal contempt under this. And criminal contempt occurs if I scandalize the court. Mind you, this is not colonial. This act is 1971. Mind you, it has been abolished in Britain. Mind you, in 1899, the Privy Council said, we don't need it in England, but let's have it in the colonies. And in 1962, after independence, the Sanyal Committee said, we must have this provision. A Law Commission report said, we must have this provision. Justice Krishna Iyer, former member of the Law Commission, former Chief Justice of the country, 
when he spoke about the speed of dispute resolution, he was prosecuted under this provision. It was a different matter that he was not punished. And there is also the mindset of the constitution of 1950, the bedrock of everything that we are talking about in the legal system. I told you earlier, what is this based on? It's based on the, on the Government of India Act of 1935, which is also largely based on the Government of India Act of 1919, which is largely based on the Morley Minto reforms of 1909. So think of the vacations of the Supreme Court. Think of the fact that Patna High Court castigated an additional chief secretary recently because he was quite neatly dressed, but he was not wearing a tie and a jacket. Think of the functioning of the legislature. Think of the functioning of the executive, the civil services. We continue to say collector and district magistrate for what? What is the collector's function that a district magistrate does today? Look at the procedures in within government. We talk about G to B, we talk about G to C. What about what happens G to G? The constitution begins with the words, we the people. And we, the people, want law, or go mention this, statutes and judgments that we can understand. Plain English. The entire legal system has been untouched. The entire bureaucracy has been untouched. The favorite expression within government, within government, is inter alia. Every time I see that expression inter alia, I throw a fit. We want the likes of Lord Denning. And on this, almost nothing has been done. 1947 to 1922, 75 years. One of the problems with India is it is a gerontocracy, aided by the fact that life expectancy is going up. Until you have attained the age of 75, now, of course, if you have attained the age of 75, you become part of the Marga Darshak Mandal. But earlier, until you attained the age of 75, you did not get to change policy. In 2022, finally, the generation that was born before 1947 crosses the threshold of 75 and therefore hopefully exists, exits. So we have a generation born after 1991. We have a generation that grew up in 1991. We have a generation that does not have a colonial chip on the shoulder. And therefore, we have a generation which deserves a decolonized India's legal system. It is something we owe posterity. It is something that all of us should work towards, it is something that all of us should demand because it is about we the people. It is not about we the government. It is not about we the judiciary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry? You want to say that? Thank you very much, Dr. Debroy. This was a real tour de force. Uh, and the, I think the anecdotes that you had is something that everyone will, will keep with them. Uh, I have several questions, but I'm going to uh, resist the temptation to ask them because we've got a large audience, particularly of people who of, uh, I think most people here are of a generation very far away from 1947. Uh, certainly we the people of India and the future of India see a lot of young people in the audience. Uh, so I'd re request you to, to raise your hands and keep your questions as brief as possible. Uh, and uh, we can take two or three questions together and then go ahead. Uh, before we, while they're getting ready with a the mic, uh, just 
add one anecdote, which uh, recently, I mean, about a month back when we were working on this, we, we saw as particularly galling. Another colonial legislation in the, is the Sautal Parganas Act, 1855. And when we were looking at that, what the act in substance does is that it allows powers to the district magistrate so that, it, so that the laws that apply in the rest of India don't apply in that area because it's felt that Sautals, and these are not my words, it's the words in the law which currently exists, are uncivilized races. And so we cannot have laws of civilized people apply to Sautal. I think at a time when we have our first president who belongs to an indigenous tribe, I think it is fitting, and I don't think any argument is needed, that we need to get rid of laws of this nature, apart from all the ones that Vivek has spoken about. Can I just react to that? Certainly. Uh, people like us sometimes don't realize the kind of oppression that results from excise acts, particularly in such areas. And not that I want to provoke anyone, which is why I restrained myself earlier, but now you've tempted me to say this. Look at the history of the scheduled tribes. Whether you like it or not, that list, it originates in what the British identified as the criminal tribes of India. That's right. And we've got an entry in our book that deals with it. Yes. Uh, I'll just take some questions from the back and then I'll slowly come forward. There's a question there. Uh, if you could have the mic send it. Keshav. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you for an excellent talk, Dr. Debra. I'm Nilanjan Gupta, alumnus of the Indian Law Institute. So I spent many years studying the subject you spoke about. Uh, I want to say Dr. Chandrachut produced a voluminous massive volume of over a thousand pages on India's criminal code, the Indian Penal Code. In the introduction, he writes, the IPC is the most perfect piece of uh, legislation and laws ever drafted by the British. And it is so perfect it's in, in its entirety, it should never be modified or changed. And no Indian amendment to it could do justice to it in its original form. There is also in the IPC a section 509 which is a colonial antiquated law, which is outrage of modesty of women. And it is misused by the police, particularly Delhi police, to arrest any and anybody on the smallest of pretexts. And um, so my question is with all these, with the attitude so embedded, deeply embedded in the Indian judiciary in favor of the colonial system, how do you think we can get rid of it? I should just well, clarify that this was Dr. Y. V. Chandrachur, the yes, father, correct. you should just clarify. Uh, I might still get into trouble because I dare not contradict a former CJI. But let me, let me sort of react. I believe that with most old statutes, actually this is true also of the constitution. You cannot tinker with a section here and tinker with a section there. Because if you tinker with a section here and a tinker with a section there, you will end up with inconsistencies and contradictions across the sections. You should start with the first principles. Why do I need this statute? What happens if I don't have this statute? What are the, what are the costs to not having this statute? What are the costs associated to with having this statute, including judicial costs, you might think that the statement of objects and reasons does this. Just compare the earlier statements of objects and reasons with the current statement of objects and reasons. They know nothing of the kind. So far as the IPC is concerned, IPC draft form was drafted by Lord Macaulay, who's much abused in this country. Lord Macaulay was not a trained lawyer. There was a Lord Macaulay draft in 1835. The final IPC is not Lord Macaulay's draft. If you just compare the two, 
you will find Lord Macaulay's draft was very precise in use of language. All the parts in IPC which say illustration this, example that, are required because the language is not precise. And all of those sections are post Macaulay. Just compare the two. IPC, I think we need to start from scratch, from first principles. That's, we have two questions there. We'll take those two. Himanshu, if you could just send the mic there. Just speak up a little bit. I think we'll, we should be able to hear you while we get another mic. Yeah, am I audible? Yes. So firstly, thanks to uh, Dr. Debroy for uh, giving such a wonderful lecture. And thanks to Viti for organizing it. So my question is that uh, the common people of India relate to the legal system from the symbols. So the attire we wear, we say your lordship, your ladyship, and we enter the courts, we bow down. And uh, as far as the Indian society today is concerned, so it is named as a right-based society, which is having its roots in the colonization itself, the uh, Adhikar Pradhan civilization, as we name it, and how the movement towards a decolonization, uh, a, a decolonized country, which would be a Kartavya Pradhan civilization or the duty prone society is possible. So basically that there are two questions. First, uh, how and why the importance, uh, uh, are we having any importance of the symbols? And second, the movement from rights to duties, if any. Thank you, sir. Well, that sounded to me more like a comment. And let me be very clear about what Dr. Argasen Gupta said. He said, you are free to answer, ask me questions. He did not say I would answer those questions. <laughs> because some of those questions will be answered in due course by Vidhi. <laughs> but let me react to your general statement. Back of the envelope. Please do not read more than that into the numbers. Back of the envelope. How many cases are there in India? Roughly 40 million. A little bit more if you include quasi-judicial court. Roughly two-thirds of criminal cases. Criminal cases, one side the litigant is the government. But I'm doing this for purposes of illustration, nothing more. In a civil case, there will be two sides. 40 into 2, 80. You will say this is not quite correct because on the criminal side, I have a party as a government on one side. But then on the civil side, you will have multiple litigants. How many households are there in India? About 225 million. So roughly about one third of every household in India is litigated. Back of the envelope. But it's a striking image. Despite Damini and Tariq Pe Tariq, despite Jolly LLB, a lot of people in India have faith in the judicial system. There used to be a time in the 1970s when Bollywood, all films depict society, when Bollywood was full of people who essentially said, heroes who said, to hell with the legal system, I will deliver justice. Notice how this is going away. Which sort of underlines the fact that it is extremely important to fix the legal system. And the question that, 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 that then arises is how do we fix it? Changes happen because questions are asked by citizens, by civil society. The Environment Protection Act and the Consumer Protection Act of 1986 did not happen because government decided to do that. There was already the countervailing pressure by citizens and civil society. 
Little for RTI. Look at the number of times we ask questions about the prime minister and the cabinet of ministers. Look at the number of times we ask questions about politicians. And contrast that with the number of times we are demanding about the legal system. Therein lies your answer. Take the gentleman right behind. You said that the tinkering with the law is not possible. It is possible, not desirable. Okay. And uh, in the last part of the of your lecture, you said uh, you required a reason for decolonizing. In the last part of your lecture, you said just because the new generation is coming the, after the independence, 92, 75 years, new generation is following up. You need this decolonizing. So any other reason or it should, it should have been done We have always before. needed it. We need it even more now that we are talking about what India will be like in 2047. Even more that we are now talking about Amrit Kal and setting out the template for 2047, the next 25 years. If we don't do this now, when on earth are we going to do it? I think we can, there's, so, there's a few more. If we can just give some other people a chance also. There's one there and then we'll come to <coughs> Yeah, and then we'll come this way. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. So, uh, my question is very simple. Uh, my question is, sir, the colonial government recognized women as the underprivileged. My question is, sir, do you recognize, do you think that men are at least as underprivileged in equal measure as the women? Because most people who are suffering from higher mortality, higher morbidity, higher number of suicides, and almost all kinds of suffering anywhere in the world. It's men. Thank you, sir. Well, I will treat it as a comment, which I don't agree with, and leave it at that. It was not a question. We'll come here. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Dr. Chandrakant Pandahu. I spent 45 years at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. I'm also called the ID man of India. And in 2021, with humility, I want to say, Government of India confirmed Padma Shri on me. Since I'm Pandav, my question is related to the reference of Pandav you made in your speech. Itama Bhishma Nidhishta, the dialogue between the day. I want to know more and read about more about it. Just give me a reference. And then I'll carry it forward. Well, depends on whether you want to read it in English, whether you want to read it in Sanskrit, whether you want to read it in Hindi. If you want to read it in Sanskrit, then of course the critical edition brought out by the Bhandarkar Institute. If you want to read it in Hindi, I would recommend the Gita Press. If you want to read it in English, how can I not recommend my translation? And the books are available outside for anyone who wants to purchase. We'll, we'll go there and then come forward. There's one right at the back. And then there will be two questions here. And then we'll end. Dr. Debra, since we were on the subject of courts, I'd like to give you the opportunity to react to another small anecdote. In 2010, when the question arose as to whether the RTI Act applies to the Calcutta High Court, the public information officer wrote to the chief information commissioner of the time and stated that since we are constituted under the letters patent of Queen Victoria, our only overlord is the reigning British monarch and uh, not the Parliament of India or any state legislature. Thankfully, the CIC threw this argument out the window and says nothing doing it applies. But the question really is, uh, it's all fine with parliament, state legislatures and laws, but what do we do about our courts really? Well, I've already answered that in several ways. But I should say that a lot of the discourse concentrates on the Supreme Court and the high courts. But bulk of cases are stuck in the lower courts. And we should also worry about the lower courts the conditions under which the judges serve there, 
I think the discourse on law reform or judicial reform has been overtaken excessively by the Supreme Court and the High Court. I'm not saying that those changes are unimportant, but I'm saying we should also look at the lower courts. We'll take one question here in front and then the two hands there and we'll end with that. I'm sorry there are many questions, but we have to finish. Yeah, Dr. Dev Roy, just give me basic thing about legal system. Is it for government, people or justice? A recent example of two finger test has been banned, but still it's going on. So why these things are happening like this? Well, that I think will require another lecture. <laughs> <laughs> we go to the, we go two quick questions there. Thank you, Dr. Debroy. Uh, I have a question. You said that change is only possible when there is question from the citizenry. But uh, as you know, there's a certain sort of apathy towards the legal system and litigation. So how do we fight that apathy that citizens have that, uh, you know, act as a deterrent from asking them or raising questions? So that's my question. Thank you. I think I would say before responding to your question, I'm really, really sticking my neck out. I think the judiciary has now fallen prey to the bar much more than was the case in the 1950s. This is an indirect democracy. We are not Switzerland. So how do we raise our voices? In an indirect democracy, we raise our voices through parliament and state legislatures. That is the way we exercise our countervailing force. Was that the last one? No, there are two. Okay. One. And we'll finish with that. Uh, there's one there. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Zebra. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your lecture that uh, part of the project of decolonizing a legal system would also require us to think of the role of the state and what role that should play in, let's say, business or in the public sphere generally. And mm -hmm. I wanted to ask what you think that role should be like, because there are several directions in which um, that thought could go. It could go towards the withdrawal of the state or um, this more fundamental duties. Uh, Again, it requires aspect. a wrong answer, but stated simply, the state has a benign role, it has a malign role. It has a benign role where it needs to do things when for various reasons to use an economic jargon, there's market failure. And it has a malign role when it unnecessarily causes intervention. To use the PM's words, both of these are captured under ease of living, and ease of doing business. Unfortunately, under the British, the system became excessively centralized. Unfortunately, after independence, in the heyday of planning, it continued to be centralized. So look at the number of times Several people here use the word center state and center state relations. Why? There is no center in the constitution. The word in the constitution is union. So mindsets have become centralized also. Particularly those who belong to earlier generations. How many people work for the government in India? Union government, 3 million. All government, excluding PSUs, 6 million. In a workforce of something like 480 million, that's nothing. So the government really needs to be at the level of local bodies, local organs of governance, which is where we expect the public goods. But look at the debate. We will debate about the all India services. 
Incidentally, in British times, the district collector often used to be senior to the chief secretary because that was perceived to be the cutting edge. Imagine something like that happening today. So there is a whole set of issues connected with this and part of it is of course an ideological debate about what the state should do. As I said, I think in passing earlier, we have come to expect the state to do too many different things. One last question. Hi. So I'm framing the question in a bit simplistic manner, although the topic is very complex, but given the paucity of time. So you have beautifully framed the problem statement and we also debated the need to, I mean, why to decolonize the Indian legal system. But if you have to list out like four to five immediate steps, maybe in the midterm and the long term, which India as a society need to take to not only decolonize this legal system, but also the minds as you spoke about it, what would those steps be? I think I will duck the question for a very valid reason. Two reasons. One is when I was engaged in this law reforms project, I wanted to bring lawyers and economists together, a law and economics kind of movement in India. Didn't happen because economists were not interested in the law and lawyers did not understand economics. The approach of lawyers and economics generally tends to differ. A lawyer is interested in correcting an immediate wrong. How will I compensate you for a, something that has happened to you? An economist looks at the more long-term and the dynamic. How do I ensure that there is deterrence for the future so that someone else does not commit the crime? As long as that law reforms project existed, I wasn't able to bring the two together, not successfully. The various five-year law schools tried to do it with no great success, including the private ones. I am delighted that in the last few years, we have the likes of Vidhi and Daksh, which are doing exactly that. They're setting the discourse, they're, they're setting the template for the discourse. So instead of saying one, two, three, four, I will say, one, read with his reports. Two, read Dutch reports. Three, don't read Law Commission reports. <laughs> if that is the last, I want to end with an anecdote, if I may. This anecdote is from the Valmiki Ramayana. It is from the Uttar Khand, which some people believe is an interpolation. It came later. It is not in the critical edition of the Palmiki Ramayana, the one brought out by the Baroda Institute. King Rama is back in Ayodhya. Ravana has been killed. All is well with the world. There is Rama Rajya. There are no wicked people. Everyone is good. No one dies before their time. There is no drought, there is no famine, there is no illness. Nonetheless, Rama says, Lakshmana, every morning you must go out into the courtyard. Because I've passed an instruction that anyone who has a complaint can come and ring the bell. And that person will be brought to me for redress. Fine. One day Lakshmana goes and finds a dog there. The dog says, I have a complaint. He must take me before the king. Lakshmana says, a dog cannot go before a king. How can a dog go to court? Dog says, who said? King Rama says, everyone can go. So persuaded, Lakshmana goes with the dog before Rama. And the dog comes out with his story. 
What is the story? The dog was sleeping on the road. Along came a Brahmana. The dog was in the Brahmana's path. So the Brahmana picked up his stick and beat the dog on the head. And the dog said, it's a crime. If the Brahmana had simply asked me to move, I would have moved. He didn't even ask me to move. He took out his rod and began to beat me. So you must punish him. So the Brahmana is called. The cross-examination takes place. And the Brahmana says, yes, indeed, it happened like this. There was no perjury in those days. The dog says, now he's admitted he was punishing. King Rama asks all of his ministers and advisors. They say you cannot punish a Brahmana. A Brahmana cannot be punished. The dog says, you are the king, you must punish the wicked. He is wicked, you must punish him. So King Rama looks at the dog and says, all right, dog, you tell me what I should do with him. There's a fort called, called Kalinjar. It still exists. It's a sort of border between MP and UP. The lord of Kalinjar was called Kuladhipati, which in some states means chancellor and vice chancellor also. But anyway, forget that. The dog said, Make the Brahmana the Kuladhipati of Kalinjar. So this is what is done. The Brahmana is put on an elephant, given a lot of treasure, with a lot of fanfare and an escort, he goes off and becomes the Kuladhipati of Kalinjar. The ministers and advisors asking Rama, what is this? You're supposed to punish him, you rewarded him. King Rama says, the dog is wiser than the lot of you. Dog, tell them the story. The dog said, in my last life, I used to be the Kuladhipati of Kalinjar. If you are the Kuladhipati, it gives you plenty of avenues for crime and bribery and rent-seeking and corrupt behavior. Because of those crimes, in this life, I have been born as a dog. So King Rama says, see, this is what justice delivery truly is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Debroy. As in keep, keeping with the theme of decolonizing our laws and legal systems and our minds, this was the most appropriate way to end this, to think about alternative justice systems that have existed and will hopefully one day again exist. I'd like to call my colleague Keshav to present a small token of our appreciation to you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Dr. Debroy. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming this evening. It's been a really wonderful lecture. And thank you for, for turning out in such large numbers. Do keep following Vidhi in all its work. Read our reports and everybody else's reports. And as Dr. Debroy said, the only way we will be able to decolonize is if we demand decolonization. So I hope each of us will take away that and any other lesson that we would like to. Thank you very much once again. Good night.